Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dadia. In this week's episode, I am honored to welcome Dr. Farid Isak. Dr. Isak is a traditionally trained scholar and a successful academic in modern universities. He has authored many famous written books on Islam and is arguably the world's leading Islamic liberation theologian. He was appointed as Gender Equality Commissioner by Nelson Mandela. Through the organization, The Call of Islam, Dr. Sok played a leading role in the struggle against apartheid. He advocates interreligious solidarity against all forms of injustice and has worked extensively to support Muslims infected with HIV. He is currently head of the Department of Religion Studies at the University of Johannesburg. In 2018, he was awarded the Order of Lutili, South Africa's highest civilian order, for his contribution to scholarship and work for justice. Dr. Sapp has also lectured at many distinguished local and international institutions of higher learning. He is a former distinguished Mason professor at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. He also occupied a university professorship in ethics, religion, and society at Xavier University in Ohio. In addition, he served for two years at Harvard University between the Divinity School and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences as the William Henry Bloomberg Professor and the Prince al Walid bin Talal Professor in Contemporary Islam. The Dr. Isak is the author of books such as The Struggle on Being a Muslim and Quran, Liberation and Pluralism, an Islamic Perspective of Interreligious Solidarity Against Oppression. In this episode, Dr. Sok shares his experience in the apartheid. We discuss what he learned from his experiences and how we can use some of the messages from the liberation movement today, where there is so much division. We also talk about after building a movement against the apartheid, South Africans had to encounter additional challenges with gender inequality and how they navigated that stage. I wanted to bring Dr. Sok on this podcast to gain some wisdom and hopefully share that with the listeners. We are currently in a time of polarization and an us against them mentality in many aspects. I wanted to use this dialogue to demonstrate that we are in this together and perhaps find some common ground through the act of love. I also believe that we have lost sight of the wisdom that sits with people who had come before us and encountered similar challenges, even though those challenges may appear different on the surface. Dr. Isak is an individual who possesses that wisdom, and I'm grateful I was able to speak with him. Finally, I wanted to highlight that the responsibility of change sits with all of us, and it is something we can all take on. I hope this conversation gives us something to think about, even if we do not agree with everything. I hope you can get a lot out of this episode, and if at the end, if you could leave a five-star review, I would truly appreciate it. Okay, so I... hello, um, Doctor Sock. Welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today and being patient with all the technological stuff. Uh, really excited to chat with you. I recently read your book, uh, KLP: Quran, Liberation, and Pluralism, um, based on the South African apartheid. And I really wanted to get your thoughts and your experience and uh, some of the things you may have learned from that and, and really wanted to share that with the listeners today in terms of what we can learn from that experience and some of the challenges we're experiencing in, in the Western world. But uh, before we go down that path, I do want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and let the listeners know a little bit about what it is that you do. Okay. Um, it's always a difficult question because in truth, uh, when you are asked uh, to introduce yourself, you, in some ways, I mean, always engage in who am I? <laughs> so yeah. The one is, who do I want to tell people that I am? But it's also, you know, who am I? Uh, anyway, um, I'm from South Africa, born in South Africa. My family for generations has been in South Africa. Mm. And at the young age of about 17, uh, I went to Pakistan uh, to a very traditional Darul Uloom uh, in Karachi. 
Um, yeah, um, I continue to value my experience in the Darlun, although I think it's also, I have, it was quite a traumatic period uh, mm. in my life. Um, so since then, um, I did, I specialized after that in Ulum Quran. I did a PhD in, uh, the, in the UK and, um, and did postdoctoral work uh, in Germany. Um, for much of my life in South Africa, I have been an activist in different fields. Uh, earlier on, in um, the earliest part of my life, and I was uh, quite active in the liberation struggle, in the South African liberation struggle. And then um, uh, subsequently, I mean, I worked extensively in the field of gender justice. And then for about more than 10 years or so, worked in the field of of Islam, uh, HIV and AIDS, and Muslims who were living with uh, HIV. I'm also an academic. Uh, I'm a professor in the study of Islam at the University of Johannesburg, where I have been for the last uh, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Before that, I taught in Germany, in Indonesia, in the Netherlands, in the United States. Um, I met Mr. Country or two, I'm sure I did, and Pakistan. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so here I am. Well, thank you again for joining me and sharing all that, lots of experience. And I did pick up on your experience in Pakistan because uh, my family's from Karachi, so that resonated for me too. Um, and you talk about the trauma, but I think that also, if I'm not mistaken, kind of informed did that experience also inform you in terms of coming back to South Africa and looking at some of the liberation struggles and looking at how traditionally Islam is being forced on people and how that was also limiting the, the liberation movement in South Africa? Did you kind of have that? Were you able to use that experience in some of the movements and, and what you were able to offer in, in that? No, absolutely, except that is not what you would think yeah because here i was uh, a full-time student in a darul ulum and darul ulum um, life or the the program is actually very very intense you know so it's a lot of time and a lot of energy but quite frankly the lessons that i brought from uh, pakistan to south africa did not, I mean, if it related to my Darulum experience, and was a lot of things about what not to do. Right. Um, my, my, my primary learnings from Pakistan uh, came from an, an awareness of two things. The one was the replication of apartheid mm -hmm. in Pakistan. Um, very, very visibly through the way women are dealt with in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. While I was there, even in this Darul Ulum, very, very conservative, it's a Diobandi Darul Ulum, and um, it's perhaps arguably one of the most prestigious Diobandi Darul Ulums on the subcontinent. It was Jamia bin Nuriya in um, what is now known as uh, Bin Nurita. So the one was my awareness of uh, how women were being treated um, and just astonishing, you know, my experience of life under apartheid. My God, this is the same, you know. So what then, I mean, later we came to call gender apartheid. But the other not inconsequential thing was also my awareness of how uh, dark skinned Christians are treated in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They normally refer to as the Punjabi Christians in contrast to the Goan Christians. So those were the, the major uh, awarenesses that I brought back to South Africa. Right. And I started uh, working on them in the relation to Muslims and apartheid, Muslims and racism. And so that's what I brought back from Pakistan, hopefully retaining some of my theological learnings. But right. yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I want to come back to the whole apartheid movement in, in South Africa, but just from a historical standpoint to understand 
you know, because you had the Dutch colonization there. How did the people come together? Because you obviously, you know, I've, I've been able to read a little bit about uh, the, the English colonization in India and then the freedom movement there. What inspired a freedom movement in South Africa? Okay, so we had a different... Uh... We had different kind of uh, colonizations over the period, you know, yeah. switching between the Dutch and the English and the Dutch and the English. And uh, finally, in 1948, a formal white supremacist pronounced white supremacist mm -hmm. party came to power, the Nationalist Party. But resistance started, I think, from the right from the beginning of colonialism um, in different forms. Um, uh, okay, in different forms. And so uh, the question, I think it's more, you know, what brought things together that led then to the final push, the last decades of the uh, apartheid uh, regime. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, we normally speak about the different pillars on which our country is uh, founded. But one of the, the, the things was this whole question of international solidarity. Um, <clears throat> of international solidarity, the armed struggle inside South Africa was escalating. Um, <clears throat> the international economic forces were increasingly recognized. Uh, uh, if you can hear some funny sounds in the background, it's the thunder. Yeah. Um, of our, uh, yeah, it's the thunder uh, that's quite common, thunder and lightning. Yeah. It's very common in Johannesburg at this time of the year. So um, a number of different forces coalesced, um, but it was largely what we would describe in South Africa, the mass democratic movement that focused on people of different political persuasions, um, all of them, of course, anti-apartheid, people of different religious persuasions, people of different uh, social formations, like, say, the trade unions or the youth organizations or civic organizations, um, religious organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, um, it was this bringing together of a broad coalition of people in the country, acting then in concert with... Uh, the band or the exiled liberation movement, the African National Congress. And then uh, just, I mean, from the 70s onwards, you know, the regime really overplayed its hand. Mm -hmm. This led, of course, to the Soweto uprisings, very famous in 1976, in 1976, where in hundreds and hundreds of school children were killed when they were protesting against um, the apartheid uh, curriculum that they were facing in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those young people went abroad and there they went over to the African National Congress, were trained and they came back and there was a, a guerrilla war that coincided with this mass mobilizations of different communities and formations. And it is in this framework of a liberation movement embracing different communities, different cultures, and um, that uh, the Muslims come in, as right. you know, that time as part of a religious, quote unquote, religious sector. But it was there that the Muslims in South Africa, for the first time, um, mobilized as Muslims. Mm -hmm. For a long time already, Muslims were active in the liberation struggle. Uh, the first political party, anti-white anti political party, was in fact formed by a Muslim, uh, uh, by a Muslim, he was a medical doctor, although he was the grandson of manumitted, of freed slaves, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman. Mm -hmm. And in 1903, he actually formed the first uh, anti-state political organization, the African People's. So Muslims have always had a history, but never as Muslims. Right. Okay. No, that's fair. And and I think what you're talking about is there was that tyranny that was predominant there that people wanted to fight against. And you drew parallels to the Exodus story in your book. And you also took passages from the Quran where you talked about, you know, there's this whole notion of us against them, whereas you were able to draw on the text and say, well, it isn't. Like the text strongly encourages 
fighting against marginalization, right? And you alluded to that marginalization, whether it's with women or some of the people that were uh, diagnosed with HIV, uh, which we'll get to later, but it was really that coming together of the people irrespective of their faith, but realizing that there is the one God and there is that unity there and we can't look at each other as different. And what was that? moment like when and how long did it take to get to that point where people finally started realizing it's not a, us against them you know farhan it was um it's not possible to say you know how long did it take it's like yeah. asking somebody you know how long did it take to learn this language well i'm still learning this language um but it wasn't easy yeah. Because uh, the weird thing about people is we identify with other people. Like, you know, uh, you're in a trade union together or you and your neighbors, you complain about the same things uh, that the municipality is doing or not doing, da, da, da. And then suddenly, you know, <clears throat> when you think, hey, you know, uh, when it comes to a Friday or a Sunday, oh, we are different. Um, and then one of your neighbors die and you say, oh, can we go to the church? And if it's a really, really good neighbor, wonderful neighbor, then you kind of ask, you know, um, can we make dua for that person? Yeah. Uh, is it right, you know, let alone go to the person's funeral? Um, so, I mean, she was like a wonderful and an amazing person. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, that person's whole identity becomes an entirely a question of a theological label. Right. I mean, so this absurdity of, of mm -hmm. otherizing people purely on the basis of them having a different label than what you have. So people seem to live with it all the time. Right. Um, and so <clears throat> what we did, I mean, uh, from the, the very early 80s onward was to, to address this theological question right the question of oh so mandela is in prison uh, mandela has been there for 25 26 years now i mean eventually he was released after yeah. 27 years so mandela is and mandela is this kind of this great figure we sing songs about him and then and, and but uh, this guy mandela uh, he's not a muslim you know therefore he is also mandala Right. Who leads astray? He and who you leads astray, you know. So people get caught, and so what we managed to do with, with a lot of theological work and community work, uh, constant mass meetings, pamphleteering, uh, using the the members. Uh, I mean, believe it or not, you know. I mean, uh, <clears throat> we had a, a significant presence. Uh, in among the ulama community, mm -hmm. and members were freely available to us to talk to the people about, you know, this uh, question about uh, interreligious solidarity. Right. Um, and in fact, I, I recently wrote uh, an article about Desmond Tutu. So I tell a story in there, you know, where one person came to one of our imams, uh, Imam Hassan, uh, Allahu Yarhamu, and he told Imam Hassan, you know, hey, you know, uh, you know, you guys, meaning the ulama amongst us, you guys are so friendly and on good terms with Desmond Tutu. And I'm talking about the Archbishop of Cape Town, this Nobel Prize winner, very famous all over the world. Yeah. Have you tried speaking to him about Islam? So uh, Imam Hassan knew where this guy was going. That like he's such a good person, man. If only you were a Muslim. Yeah. So, so Imam Hassan says, uh, "My brother, stop right there. Desmond Tutu is upright and righteous as he is. If he's going to be any more upright, he's going to be bent. Leave him alone as he is." Yeah, yeah. So, so it was. Uh, of course, it's also a theologically challenging questions because. Right. Uh, many Muslims, um, they privilege uh, orthodoxy above orthopraxis. Uh, you must just say the right things, you know. Right. Uh, Farhan, if I can take some liberty, um, 
I, also, mean, I was in my part time. I was also teaching in Pakistan uh, um, at a uh, at a at a school, mostly Muslims, but they were also Christians. And this was many years ago, and it looks like a silly analogy, but it is still valid. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I I drew two uh, cans, you know, um, this uh, cans that you find uh, food in, or right. okay. So I drew two cans on the table, under these things, and um, <clears throat> and I uh, I wrote on the one can I put a label. It's a bit of a kind of coarse. Um, um, but I put a thesis on the label of the one can, and on the other can I wrote kima, this food, you know, right. mix, ground mix. beef. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ground beef. I put ground beef on it. So I said, okay, <clears throat> now here you have these two cans. Uh, which one would you take? <laughs> so they all, of course, took said that they would prefer this can with the, with ground beef on it. So I said, okay, fine. So let me switch the labels. So this, <clears throat> to somebody who knows what's inside, uh, in the can labeled ground meat, there's actually feces in it. Right. And in the table and, and in the can it's, uh, where it's marked, um, da, 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 this so now that you know what's really going on, which one would you choose now? So they all said the one that's labeled feces. Right. I said, okay. So what do you say about a God who knows what's going on in your life, but sticks with a label? Right, right. <clears throat> and then I use the analogy of other people who they were familiar with, um, who were Christians that were all around them and kind of just deeply, deeply human, human beings. Right. So I said, okay, so uh, this brother Norman goes to hell and um, and, da, 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 and then I use other examples of, you know, kind of uh, Muslims that all of us would be ashamed about. Right. And so mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so it's a very simple, but this is, um, and we managed to get that through to people at very many different levels mm -hmm. that uh, your neighbor is your neighbor. Right. And that the solidarity of people engaged in injustice, that this is what the needs of, of our faith is. Right. And we presented this in different forms. I mean, there's a little kind of bit of a polemical booklet that I wrote, you know, but Musa went to Peron. Right. It's a collection of about 40 different uh, polemical objections that people raised. Right. against what we were doing in South Africa and a rejoinder to that. So we did this at a massive level. Um, thousands and thousands, believe it or not, of public meetings. It was, it was a huge, in spite of the struggle against apartheid, of course, the right. utilization of masks, the use of, in that time, you know, pamphlets and so on. But it was um, it was it was painful. It was difficult. It was it may have been exciting, but uh, many of our comrades paid for their lives with it. Many were detained and traumatized, brutalized um, in the in the jails. People were thrown alive out of helicopters over the seas. Mm. Um, people were spit roasted, you know, like it's a barbecue. Right. Uh, while burning, while the, you know, while other people, while the the torturers were having real barbecues next to where the fire was taking place, so um, our country has lived through horrific times, and we're now looking at all of this is very exciting. But Alhamdulillah, it was a good privilege to have been a part of that struggle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it, <clears throat> thank you for sharing all that, and even in your analogy, you know, just kind of. For me to reflect on we we to your point we often get so caught up with the label and we forget what the individual is all about right and and i think the focus really need to ships needs to shift back to recognizing people for who they are and in that whole experience it was the fight against oppression right and and what i appreciate is you know, even in the work you did in the book, you kind of 
came, you kept coming back to what the Quran says against oppression and forgetting about how we're interpreting who's who, right? And the labels, but it's really that fight against oppression. And, and you know, to your point, even in the, the, the Exodus story with, with Moses and, and the Pharaoh, there is that part where even leaving, there's that aspect of the desert. And, you know, th that, that's something I want to come back to when you mentioned that after all the work you guys did, there was still that newfound marginalization against women and, and some of the people that, whether it was like the gay rights movement or, or HIV diagnosed people, what was like, what was that like? Because, you know, you've made such a huge progress against the amplified and then all of a sudden you've got more mountains to climb when it comes to marginalization so the first thing uh farhan that we learned from this exodus paradigm the story of nabi musa yeah. is that people don't have to be good and righteous to deserve liberation right so you know you say oh you know look at how these people behave you know these Black Lives people, you know, they drink beer when they're on their marches. These Black Lives people matter. <clears throat> uh, look at how they dress. The women in their, by the way, it's always the women. The women is never the men, but okay. So yeah. uh, how can we stand with them? But the people, the people of Nabi Musa, <clears throat> they, by all accounts, you know, they were people of very weak faith. Even yep. or possibly even of no faith, but they were an oppressed community. I mean, as soon as they got the heck out of Egypt, they started creating this golden calf that they worshipped. Nabi Musa had hardly gone away for a half an hour, and he comes back, and then uh, okay. So that's the first thing uh, that we learned from this. <clears throat> the second thing that we learned from this is that <clears throat> when you take people. <clears throat> and you are engaged in a liberation struggle, you have no guarantee <clears throat> that this tomorrow is that the, that the day is going to be a perfect opposite of the night. Mm -hmm. That on the contrary, <clears throat> the day is murky, uh, there is a da -da, and, <clears throat> and so what do you now do? <clears throat> At a personal level, the first thing to recognize is that we don't engage in a struggle because we are going to attain victory. Right. Um, and another part of my early life is in the Tablighi Jamaat. You know, and in the Tablighi Jamaat, there was um, always uh, something that, you know, um, that, that we learned. And that is that, um, that you have to do what you have to do. That the consequences, the results, that's not your business. Right. You don't bring guidance to whom you want to. That is God's job. Right. So, so, so now, you know, now you ask, okay, so you guys did so much. You did so much for the liberation struggle. And now new demons have emerged. And uh, many of the demons that have emerged, they were your comrades of yesterday. So there is corruption. <clears throat> there is a whole range of other things. Right. So... <clears throat> But did you engage in a struggle because uh, you're going to win? Or because this was, uh, this was a moral need, a mm -hmm. moral... Of, you know, there's one story <clears throat> that I often narrate, and I don't care whether it is true or not, but it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very significant story for me. Most of us know the tale of Nabi Yusuf, when he was abandoned in the well by his brothers, and yeah. then he was where, you know, he was regarded as a slave, da, da, da. And then <clears throat> there was an elderly woman, yeah, this is the story, okay? An yeah. elderly woman 
she had a dream that uh, God's servant, Nabi Yusuf, was going to be sold on the slave marketplace the next day. Um, of course, there's also the good looks reputation around Nabi Yusuf. So we would have done the round about this kind of oh, gloriously handsome, da -da -da, you know, on the market. And then this woman was seen going to the market with a small bale of wool in her hand. And somebody asked her, where are you off to? And she said, she's going off to the slave market. Uh, what are you going to be doing there? She said, oh, I heard, I had a dream that God's servant was going to be sold and I'm going to make a bid for him. So kind of, so they mocked at you and this bale of wool. And she said that, look, on the day of judgment, let it not be said that I did not do what is within my capacity to, to buy him and liberate him. Mm -hmm. So this is the challenge that we have, you know. So then we don't become impressed or depressed by the outcomes. We know that our lives is just one of uh, continuous struggles. Right. But the one other thing that was in some ways latent in your question is <clears throat> um, new oppressions that we... Uh, <clears throat> that may lie buried, um, <clears throat> that we weren't aware of. And this includes, I mean, <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> well, we were when our country's liberation, when we, when we fought our new constitution. I mean, the one amazing thing about South Africa's new constitution is that it, it may sound long-winded, but it actually lays down um, the it, it names all the forms of discrimination that will not be allowed in the new South Africa. Right. And, and one of those forms of discrimination is um, on the basis of uh, discrimination in, uh, on the basis of, say, heterosexuality or same-sex sexuality, uh, or on the basis of race or religion and language. So... <clears throat> So many of those, uh, was, it's, it's fascinating, I think, because initially, you know, it appeared as if our country's struggle was one for racial justice. But in the way in which we fought the struggle, we incorporated all of these elements into it. Right. So when we created the new South Africa, huh, a disability as a human right, mm -hmm. and this by this nearly 30 years ago, you know, so... Um, <clears throat> So there was cognizance of, um, <clears throat> of the humanity and the rights of, um, of communities that uh, didn't have their rights clearly articulated uh, at that uh, time. Of course, it's challenging, you know, it's challenging because many communities, uh, <clears throat> when doors of freedom open, they're happy to go in. But for God's sake, please close the door behind me. I right. don't want anybody else to come in. So <clears throat> wait, you know, um, wait, you know, this door is a door of freedom. Right. And I'm sorry, <clears throat> you know, uh, you may not like the color or the, the race or the gender or the sexuality of the person behind you. And besides, uh, <clears throat> when we let the Muslims in, don't think there weren't any of them among the Muslims also. But right. Muslims like to imagine, you know, no, the sinful people, da, 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 it's only, it's non-us. Not only Muslims, by the way, many others. Uh, let me not uh, exceptionalize the Muslims. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, but it's fascinating. The country has held together all of these things. Um, <clears throat> religious communities, uh, we don't have, I mean, you know the word secularism? It doesn't feature in South African politics. Um, <clears throat> at all. So there's a lot of respect for religion and religious communities. Um, <clears throat> all state occasions also open with religious uh, du'as and da da, da 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 at least from three different religions. Yeah. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but, um, but still there's poverty, there's different kinds of marginalizations, there's environmental justice, newer and newer challenges that often we weren't aware of. Yeah. Right, right. <clears throat> no, thank you for building on that. And I guess 
you know what stuck out to me in that story with the the lady who was going to the slave market too i you know i and i just want to circle back on that because and come back to kind of the reason why i wanted to chat with you too is right now myself included a lot of us are stuck in what can i do to make a change right and there's opportunity all around us and we can question ourselves that did i do everything possible within my means and there is this huge divide right now. There's polarity, there's complaint around, especially in the Western world, like with the government, with some of the things that are happening. And we all have a responsibility to take. And if we truly believe that things aren't going right, we can all do something within our means rather than just complaining and pointing the finger. What can you advise people like myself and you know, some of the stuff you're hearing in terms of all the divide we have from your own experience that we can learn from and, and use moving forward. You know, uh, Farhan, the most important thing, I think, it is to be, <clears throat> to remain committed to a life of activism. And at the same time, in the middle of this to recognize that we have only 24 hours in a day, that we have limitations as human beings, uh, whatever these limitations may be, and that we have to be patient and loving towards ourselves and towards the movements that we are committed to. So this is um, just an awareness and a patience. I often use an expression in Afrikaans, I use it in English now, uh, it sounds cuter in Afrikaans, um, uh, the road is long, um, <clears throat> the road is long, uh, victory in our lives is uncertain, um, but because the road is long, we need to ensure that we have food for the road. Mm -hmm. So you don't deplete yourself. Look, you can only be there for somebody else or for a movement or for a cause if you are. So, <laughs> so you have to you have to hold yourself right. and believe in yourself and to love yourself. So, but this must be combined with a, a both a strategic and a personally reflexive practice. So, uh, you don't say, you know, uh, oh, you know, prophets were also persecuted. So, anybody that is, but no, you know, you could be up to a whole lot of bull and you end up legitimately, you know, on the margins. People, because you know, uh, you, uh, yeah, because you, you you have no way of speaking. You've got no adab. You've got no, and then you just say, "Oh no, it's because I speak the truth." That's why. No, no, no. So we have to think strategically. We have to think about what is the most effective. This hikma to call to the path of God with wisdom and the best form of advices. So this ability to stand back, yay. Uh, did we mess up as a movement? Hey, did I mess up in what I did today? And the ability to listen to feedback and to have our own. So it's a combination of cherishing yourself, mm -hmm. cherishing your movement, a sense of loyalty. And this combined with an ongoing, Farid, Farid, man, you can't keep on doing this, Farid. You can't bullshit yourself like this, Farid. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing, you know, gosh, you know, uh, I'm moving towards God, the God will, da, da, da. But I also need to sit back and think about, yeah, you know, you know, people have this weird thing about uh, praising always constructive criticism. And what they actually mean by that is criticism that I like. But <clears throat> I said, any kind of criticism, bro. <clears throat> um, bro. Um, <clears throat> it would, I mean, I may not be able to, uh, to uh, engage you when it is destructive criticism, but bloody hell, I still have something to think about, you know. What right. on earth made you see that thing in me? But I... So a combination of a determination, you know, um, uh, uh, to, you know, wajahidu fillai haqqa jihadi, to struggle, you know, in the path of God as you have to struggle. And at the same time, you know, uh, you fear God, 
to the extent that you can. Mm -hmm. I'm a human being, man, 24 hours in a life, uh, in a life, you know, uh, I get diverted, I get into a mess, I, yeah, they yeah. say, you know, in the garden of humanity, what, uh, what in the garden, okay, in the garden of humanity, what isn't grown is busy dying. So mm -hmm. it's like this perpetual growth until we die. But more important than other the things that I wrote about somewhere else um, <clears throat> is, uh, Oh gosh, I've lost my uh, my trend of uh, thought now. Yes. No, that's great, and and I mean, the biggest takeaway for me from that is the biggest struggle is really with the self, right? And and I think that's the battle we all must fight every day is is the one with the self and try to keep ourselves accountable and and focus on what we can do. But that self, it's also becomes alive in community yes. and in formations. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I'm not just saying it's, I mean, Black Lives Matter doesn't uh, only matter to Black people. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, gender issues only matter to women. So <clears throat> we are also part of those struggles. And so how we are and how do we become and how do we reflect on ourselves and become better person? better persons i mean all of that it's also played out inside organizational uh, social formations that are uh, engage in a struggle against uh, different forms of injustices yeah 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 well thank you dr sak i really appreciate you taking the time and having this conversation with me i'm really honored that i was able to get a hold of you uh you know reading your book really made a huge difference for me for many reasons. But uh, I typically give guests an opportunity to share how listeners can get a hold of them. I'll give you that opportunity if you want to share. But uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm easy. Well, I'm easy to contact. I'm not sure how easily I am, I am to get hold of, meaning to pin down, yeah. you know. But um, I'm at the University of Johannesburg. Um, my email address is uh, online. It's public. I mean, when you open yeah. it or you That's try to, I'm yeah. quite a Googleable uh, character. And um, I do respond. It takes me a bit of a long time sometimes to respond, uh, but I do respond. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, it. man. It's a thank you for checking out this episode with Dr. Isak. As always, please leave a review or subscribe to the podcast. Those are the best ways to support this podcast. And until next week.